Welcome to NixCon. This is awesome. Thank you so much. This is great. Um, so the first thing I want to start with is say, yeah, we're going to try to kind of do this whole conference as a way to get a lot of incoming excitement, a lot of beginners. That was the whole focus for how we kind of put this together, was focus on this kind of new arena, focus on the people who are uh, trying to uh, kind of show up and learn about this. And so for that, that's kind of what all the workshops are kind of a little bit more geared towards, as the talks are going to be geared towards. So the first thing I kind of want to ask is, um, who already is comfortable with using Nix? Give me some hands. Higher. Higher, 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 okay, okay. I see some people who I know are lying. Higher, 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 keep them up. No, no, keep them up, keep them up. Okay, okay, okay. Everyone who doesn't have their hands up, these are people you should ask questions to. <laughs> Thank you for volunteering. Thank you for accepting the responsibility of introducing Nix to all the other people. <laughs> Sure, why not? <laughs> so, um, I actually mean this uh, seriously. Like, there's a lot of people here who are like, we just heard about this, we just showed up, we don't know anything about it. And, well, we also have people here who know a lot of things. So, talk to each other, interact, and uh, yeah, you saw the hands, so thank you for volunteering. <laughs> All right, uh, so yeah, so I'm uh, Tom Breckney. Uh, you might know me as Tom Breck, and we're gonna try to give you, just kind of get you started, kind of figure out how this whole, uh, crazy thing that works while we're dealing with technical difficulties. <laughs> okay. Um, so you heard about Nix. Somebody told you it's cool. Um, reality, this. Um, very. So you will, as we all did, fall into the trap of Nix. It promises us a lot. It actually delivers a lot of those things, but it's really hard to get there. This talk, this workshop, the main focus is we know about those traps. Um, we'll bring them, we'll basically go together through them. Uh, we won't discover all the traps. You'll find some of them yourself. But basically what we will get is, of course, <laughs> we'll talk about a bit, first trap is ecosystem. Where is what? How do you get access? What are all those names uh, that you'll hear? The second thing, we'll go together and install uh, Nix. Yes, please. Yeah, so the, we have a bit of a problem with recording. It's being uh, the slides. The slides will be public, and recording is happening there. Hi, mom. No birthday. No, no need to sing yet. Um, so, um, yeah. Where was I? Installing Nix. It's as much as Nix should be easy to install, they are problems, as with any software. But once you have Nix, you know, everything gets easier. Uh, well, next thing, we'll go through over some basic commands, some pitfalls that we have. We are improving things, of course, in the Nix ecosystem, but there are still some um, things that you're used to from uh, other tools that maybe work differently than expected. We'll go together through them. Then we'll have, we'll talk about flakes. No, doesn't matter if you know about them or not. We'll explain them. Next language. That's a hurdle. You see where it comes. It's where it becomes really steep. That's uh, the point. And then we'll go, how do you use it? The next language to create your own development environment. We'll go, we'll look. That's an advanced topic, but we'll still just briefly look at it, just give you a, a hint how to create a custom package. Uh, and at last, we'll just unwrap the basic, let's say, concepts or keywords, some reference points. Um, yeah, so that's, that's going to be the whole journey today. So let's go. You want to take this one? Switch. Okay, so one of the first things, a lot of people sometimes come to the ecosystem and there's a lot thrown at you. You kind of have all these terms that might be a little bit weird, there's all these different projects, there's all these use cases, and you have a particular use case in mind or you might have a conception or you don't even have one, and having so many concepts thrown at you at once is often difficult. So we're trying to kind of maybe establish a few of them. We can't cover all of them because that'll probably confuse people more. So first off, how does this whole thing start? Way back in uh, 2003, right, uh, Ilko wrote this thesis about, hey, we should be able to uh, deploy software, right? I actually really like the quotes. I'm just gonna keep reading this every time I'm on any stage. 
Right, this thesis is about getting computer programs from one machine to another and having them still work when they get there. That's really not a, that's a pretty good statement of what it is that we're trying to do. So go read it if you want, um, but that's great. So some references, some links, so you guys can kind of get started. We're gonna cover a lot of just about what the Nix language and the CLI does today and get you started. Um, that's kind of the contents of this workshop. Um, Again, it's not going to explain everything. It's not going to go into all the details. It's, we're just going to give you enough of an introduction so you kind of see how people are using this. Question in the back. Uh, we can try to do some dimming, yes. Or no, maybe not. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, so the... And the, the idea here is not always, obviously to go into like any, anything advanced. As soon as we start to find ourselves starting to talk about advanced topics, we try to you know, pull ourselves back and not go into so much detail. <laughs> All right, so um, Nix is this kind of tool that allows you to run those programs on other machines and get, make, make them work. But you need other things around in the ecosystem. <laughs> Just do that really, really fast. And that might work. So uh, the next big piece of the ecosystem that you'll probably kind of come across is this thing called Nix packages. Okay. Woo! Yes. Woo! Uh, Nix packages is a, a bunch of recipes, a bunch of descriptions of software that is out there. A large piece of the open source world is kind of available via this mechanism, and it's maintained by a bunch of people doing a lot of hard work for a long time. So definitely thank them. And this thing is pretty big, it's pretty expensive, uh, expansive, and it's pretty useful. And knowing how to navigate it, though, can get complicated. So we'll try to kind of introduce some portions of this. Then there's more pieces uh, to the ecosystem, right? Then people said, hey, this idea of making software work is really good, okay? Making it reliable is really good. What if we build an operating system on this? Okay, we're gonna build it on, as a Linux distribution and do a whole bunch of things with this package manager. Because up until this point, the operating system, they didn't have an operating system for this. It was actually a package manager that coexisted on other systems. Whatever your other system was, you'd kind of put Nix on it and use it. With Nix OS, people said, hey, let's kind of take this idea and kind of run with it. So I also wanna make sure there's, it's clear that you don't have to use the operating system to use Nix. It's often a misconception, probably because the uh, web page URL is NixOS. Apologies for that. And there's lots of other things out there. And each of these things either have a use case or it was just someone's crazy idea that became popular or is just a crazy idea and just is still a crazy idea. But there's a lot of things in the ecosystem. We just want to give you the highlights of like where to get started. Okay, um, so one of the first things that we wanna, I wanna say is, before we get into actually getting started, is uh, we know it's kind of gonna have, there's a lot of people here. If we wanna do some overflow, I know they're gonna be trying to set up some talks outside, but the format we're trying to go for here is a lot of questions. We're gonna go pretty slow and try to make it so that everyone can kind of either like keep, keep up, keep track, we want this to be hands-on. We don't want to be up here like lecturing. So we're gonna be like introduce the concept or introduce something and then we're gonna actually just kind of walk around and make sure everyone's kind of understanding it, kind of do this in a step-by-step -step motion. So, uh, yeah, let's get this started. Rock? First obstacle, installing Nix. Um, it's not hard if it works. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what you will do, you will Google, most likely, or Bing it. Um, uh, and you will find this website, and you will go to it, and you will be presented with something like this. Um, hopefully that's the last time you will curl something in your shell, uh, but the first problem th th uh, is there because there is a choice. While choice is nice, in this case, is a problem. And what's the uh, choice that you have to select for? We have a multi-user, installation, which is recommended, and a single user installation. And you will say, why is that important? Even worse, we say, 
when you do multi-user, our the flag for the installer is dash dash daemon. So it's not multi-user, but daemon. And the other one, no daemon. So this is the first problem, and you know it scares a lot of people. What should I do? So a bit below this, of course, a lot of people miss it. I did. Um, is what are the pros and cons? This is going to be very sort of short. If the uh, the multi-user installation will in, uh, is a bit more involved, it does create users, as the name suggests, and it runs then after the daemon. But it's a and but it produces a better installation of Nix. The single user is much easier because you literally just put the binary somewhere, but it's the there is no daemon. The daemon which runs in the background assures the packages will be built reproducibly. Now this might not be a problem if you're using uh, in all the environments. So if you can use the multi-user installation or the daemon installation, we can also say, um, and if not, single user, uh, they are environments where you cannot run the daemon in the background. An example of them, one example of them is a Docker environment. Right, so inside the Docker, when you install it, majority of the time you will run in a single user installation. What does that mean from a user point of view when you will you be using? Uh, when you're going to be installing packages from already pre-built, everything will work. Command line works the same way. Everything behaves the same. The only problem becomes, I mean the problem, the only um, difference comes when you are building new packages. And when you are building uh, the things that you built, what we say in X is they might be not pure, not reproducible. But, um, yeah. I mentioned Nix. This is how you get, we, we also ship uh, Nix in a Docker. Uh, that's, if you want to try Nix, you're familiar with Docker. We all have to be, that's how it is. <laughs> um, Docker run slash it nix slash nix, and you will be greeted with a, a nix installation. Um, there is also some other instructions on the website how to mount the current directory so that you can work with your current um, code base. There is also <coughs> what we forgot to say. Well, there is also another, uh, let's say, we're looking forward how to improve this installation. So there is a different installer being uh, developed alongside the existing installer. Uh, it's being done by determinate systems. Uh, it's a bit more reliable. Um, so if you, the, the default, uh, the official one fails, you might give this one a try. You'll have maybe more luck. Um, and this is hopefully soon, soon going to become an official one, right? So um, thank you, determinate systems, for work to work on this. Where are you? Thank you. Um, verify that you're running Nix on your system when you install it. And now the important part. Um, this workshop, um, how to explain this? To not confuse you more. Let's put it this way. Nix is a community of people with different uh, backgrounds, different needs. And we are not maybe so um, we don't think the same. We have different as we have. We have different needs. So, how Nick started is not sort of where um, how Nick started is that it became. It was this policy-free collection of tools that you could use together. This means uh, you had a bunch of command line utilities that you were you just knew how to uh, use together. That was not very cohesive way. What happens, a lot of other package managers, because they only do package, manager, package management job, um, have this one command line utility that guides you through the whole uh, process. The UX is much better. For this reason, uh, you will need to put in your, it's not yet official, but you will need to put the, this following incantation in your Nix configuration. Uh, experimental features, Nix command, and flakes. We will explain what this means, but for the purpose of this workshop, 
we will be referencing this because it provides a better user experience, especially for somebody coming to Nix. Not the perfect one, but a much better uh, experience. Uh, we will explain what this means, right? For, for the purpose of now, this is the, the magic that will make all the other comments uh, in this talk, in this workshop uh, work. Yeah. Uh, did somebody already install Nix while I was talking? You're a lucky one. <laughs> you had a good network, that's why. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I think actually, let's just take this one as a moment of, to pause. Actually, let's go back. Um, let's actually start doing this like workshop style. So, you know, is, I presume everyone with their hands raised probably already has gone through this and is somewhat familiar. So I'm really interested in all the people who did not have their hands raised and maybe are starting to kind of go through this. Um, so if you're running into problems, we have a bunch of people with volunteers and lanyards and all those people who volunteered with their hands up, like start figuring it out. Like we're going to try to do this uh, kind of with you. So if you have any issues, if you're going through it right now, like literally raise your hand and yell at us. What is worse than installer? Absolutely. Yeah. So one nice advantage of the, the determinate system installer is you don't have to kind of do this manually. Cool. Question. The question was, is there a Docker image? Yes. So, yeah, so with uh, that particular image right there, you're going to have to go through that configuration trick as well. But there's a Docker image if you want to just have a really low barrier to getting started and don't want to deal with like making the daemon choices and all that. Question. Yes, that's the recommended one we've got on there. Um, it, again, can work either way, but the recommended is to use the multi-user. Uh, sorry, the question was, um, if you're the sole user of a laptop, should you, uh, you know, do which, which style of installation? Um, and the recommended is still to do the multi-user. Uh, some of the reasons you might not want to is if, let's say, like, you can't because of, uh, like permissions, let's say you're not the administrator for your computer, you're on some other sort of ecosystem that like makes that more difficult, then you know, you can't run services or something along those lines. You can see uh, there's, there's reasons for that. Question. Yep. Uh, switching over like that, it's gonna be, cause you some issues. So if you've got one already like up and running, then stick with that. Um, if, you need, do you need, if you already did that and you want to switch over, you still can, but you got to kind of clean up after, you kind of do kind of go through a process to install. If you've already done so, is that an issue at the moment? We can get you some help. Yeah, if you're good, you're up and running, then just leave it for now. But if you do want afterwards help to like switch that over, just contact some, one of us and, or ask someone and we can get that going pretty easily. How's everyone doing? Have we kind of caught up? I'm, I'm, we're going to slow this down as much as possible. So I want to like, I want thumbs up. I want hands up. I want whoops and hollers. Wi-Fi is slow. Wi-Fi is slow. Okay, okay. I can't. I don't know what I can do to make that faster. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which one? Okay, so, yeah, so this is basically a uh, kind of the, the configuration one line. Just add this at the end of your uh, nix.conf, located at etsy nix, nix Um And then at that point, you should be able to uh, run the following things and kind of follow along. Question, yes. Yeah, the question is if it's not created, then you can create that directory and make it. And then if it's in the right place, it'll get read. So the question was, uh, how is Nix the package manager different than other package managers? Um, we're going to answer that as we go along. 
Um, but to kind of give it just a, a quick response, um, the difference is this is something that, or the biggest difference you'll kind of see is that this is something that can coexist on uh, other ecosystems. So it's not like sometimes in uh, some places you'll have a package manager that kind of wants to own your entire system. This is kind of like an overlay. You can use this in kind of more flexible ways. There's a lot more power you get out of it. And we're trying to kind of introduce people to what some of those things are. And we'll go through that as we go through the rest of the talk. Okay. All right, let's uh, get started then. Uh, hopefully everyone's kind of caught up a little bit on installation. All right, so basic commands. Uh, this is a oh, question in the back. No. Uh, the question was, do you have to run something after you modify the configuration file? Uh, no, for, for something like this, you're not, you're not gonna have to change anything. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, we're going to run you through some basic things. Uh, it's going to be, we're going to search, how to like manage and manipulate a profile, how to run software, how to get software kind of bring, brought into your ecosystem, into your environment, and how to build things. So the format, again, is we're going to introduce, we're going to pause, we're going to give some time to explore, ask questions, and then um, proceed. All right. So. First off, uh, we want to find software. We don't, know what, we don't know where it is. We don't know what it's called. We want to find it. So, so running something like this is kind of a great way to get started. I like something like HTOP. Let's actually search for something. And uh, this is kind of like the syntax for this. Yeah. So you search for this. You say, hey, I want to get information. And one of the things is going to be the thing you asked for. Now. To explain what's going on here, uh, this is going to search for HTOP in the Nix packages set that we mentioned earlier. This is kind of the place where we have a whole bunch of packages ready and available for you, um, packaged by a bunch of maintainers who make that possible. Uh, first thing to note is the uh, you could kind of ignore this portion in the beginning that says, hey, legacy packages and whatever system you've got, because most of that's going to be filled in for you. It's going to be filled in on your behalf, but this is being like ultra-specific, a bit more ver verbose. Um, but for the most part, you don't really need to even see that portion. Um, go on. Yeah. Now, the first time you run something like this, it's going to... Oh, questions? Go ahead. Our network hit a rate limit for the API. Very nice. <laughs> hotspot. If you've got hotspots, start using them. Is, my, is it going to be the, the only, only uh, proposal I've got? All right. So... It's going to be slow the first time. See, I already predicted this. It's going to be the slow the first time. So yes, you're going to be, have to download things. This is kind of like running very uh, running the first time is also similar, like when you run app, you know, upgrade or something or, up, or update. You're going to update your your view of what it is that's going to be uh, available. But once this thing is uh, downloaded, once it's unpacked, and after you do this like first search, subsequent searches are actually going to be way faster because there's a cache that makes this things uh, a much nicer, and you'll see some sort of output like this. So hopefully we don't keep hitting the GitHub rate limit, but um, any questions so far on just like searching for things and trying to find software? There's also uh, search.nixos.org if you want to kind of do this in a web page format and just put it in there, and the results are going to be extremely similar if you're trying to get information. Yes? Correct. Can we go over that at all? Good point. Yeah. So if you're already running Nix OS, then right, it's a declarative thing. You're not going to probably be able to have right access to that configuration file. Um, there's ways to do that. So if you run into that problem, you have Nix OS already, but you don't have the config and you need help, raise your hand. Someone with the hands up will help you. Yeah, there we go. We got that one figured out. Okay, um, searching, everyone's good. Yes, thumbs up, thumbs down. Go faster, go slower. I see thumbs up, thumbs up. Okay, next. Oh, common mistake. Uh, hey, I just wanna search for HTOP, and you get like, oh my God, it didn't work, right? What happened here is the user just kind of forgot to say, where am I searching in? Uh, we don't have anything defaulted to say, hey, the, every single user wants Nix packages. We don't want Nix packages to be kind of privileged in some way over other package sets that might be out there. Um, so that's a, just a common mistake you'll see in the very beginning. That's, that's the reason behind that. Who's, told, who did the search already? Who's had a successful search? 
Hands up. Who, who is confused? Who, it's not working? Who who's, doesn't like it? Oh, if you want to pog, you got to keep those hands up. This is going to be a shoulder exercise. Keep the hands up. <laughs> okay. Yes, question. For a particular chipset. So uh, you can also do that by saying you need to search for a partic in a particular system. But um, let's I can let's answer that afterwards if you can. But you can search for other platforms if you need to. By default, the search will be for your own platform. Is that is that okay? Okay. Question. So the question is: Are there any other common repos out there you can be searching in? Yes. That's kind of the whole, that's one of the big points of this like Flake ecosystem is that there's other repositories that I can go search in, not just Nix packages. Nix packages just happens to be the, one of the biggest, you know, most important one, kind of very central to the community, but there are, you can search in any other thing. That's what, that's kind of what a Flake is when you turned on that feature, is you can go search in other Flakes for things. Okay, um, moving on. Okay, so, so first thing to, to note is uh, there's this thing called Nix Profile. Now, we use this kind of in a, often in a like ad hoc manner to quickly bring something in. This, interestingly enough, is not a, a very declarative way to do things, it's very imperative, right? So this is used to say, hey, I wanna install a piece of software, I wanna remove it, I wanna upgrade it, I wanna get rid of it, things along those lines. It's not declarative, but it's just useful. So. Uh, using something like this allows you to kind of solve this problem. So um, this is kind of the, the basics of it. Let's go see, I think there's a common, yeah, so a common mistake made with profiles is, hey, I am gonna install like some compiler and then great, okay, I'm now gonna install some libraries and you start trying to do this with a profile and it's not really gonna work usually the way you expect. So don't expect this to give you a development environment, right? Instead, expect this to just give you access to a program, right? Some sort of like command line utility or some sort of binary, but it's not gonna kind of hook everything up so that you can kind of build with libraries and install development environments or like dev tooling and things along those lines. Just think about this as you're just adding stuff to your path. That's it. Not, you know, once you start talking about libraries, this is probably not appropriate. Um, Nice thing about this is uh, you can start installing, removing things, moving things around, and this is uh, relatively cheap. There's no, you can destroy this thing, you can wipe your history, it's safe. You're not going to mess things up. This is kind of one of the benefits of Nix as the package manager, that you can start manipulating these profiles and you can roll back, you could install, you could remove, and it, it doesn't really matter all that much. So, we got a question in the back. We're gonna cover Nick Shell just a second after this, yes. Right. So one thing that this does is that it adds these packages into this profile and that gets saved in your home directory and there's a reference to it so that when you come back the next day, it's still gonna be there. So it's a little bit more permanent than Nick Shell, which we'll cover in a second, which is even more kind of ad hoc than this. Question on the right. Yes, so the question is, is this a replacement for Nick's hyphen env? That's, this is the, uh, the new, like the new Nix commands replacement for Nix env. Correct. Yes. So the question is, does this pin Nix packages? So the way that works is whatever that Nix packages is at the moment that you run this installation, it's going to be used, resolved, pinned down. And so obviously that particular profile will use that. Once you run an upgrade, if you kind of said, hey, I just want whatever the Nix packages is, then that upgrade will kind of try to say, let me try a new one. If you're very specific about what exact Nix packages you have during installation, they'll keep it there. So you kind of have that flexibility to pin it down or to kind of keep it floating over time. Question? So the question is, is there a way to export from a Nix profile into a more permanent Nix configuration? Um, built in, no. Um, there are some tools people have been playing with to make that a little bit easier to do that, and that's a direction that you know, we might go in, but built in, no. And that's one of the limitations, is that you kind of use this thing, 
and then there's like a conceptual leap to get into that, those other pieces of it. So this is kind of a little bit independent of that. Sir. Sorry? Yes, so I mean, technically there's nothing preventing that from happening, and there's tooling you, could, you can build for that, and there's ways to do it, um, but like, there's no built-in command that's like, hey, export profile, uh, but PR's welcome to the, to the next project. <laughs> All right, um, let's pause here. Are we good on this? Any questions, any thoughts, anyone hit any problems? How are we with the GitHub rate limiting? We're not, okay, we're bad on the rate limiting, okay. Oh. Okay. Question. So the question is, uh, should we instruct people to uh, use their GitHub tokens so that we get more, um, get off the rate limiting? Uh, that likely would work, but then getting everyone coordinated all at once to do that the right way, it might, I don't know, at this point that's, that might be kind of a bit too late. Um, but if you know how to do it, absolutely do it. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, there are a few other places off the top of my head. I'm not, I don't know what, what, what other ones to point you at uh, for other Git mirrors. So uh, in terms of hitting that rate limit, I think the best option you got is to try to use hotspots. I just, just because we're hitting, like everyone's we're coming, coming out of one, you know, access point and we look like there's just one person hitting it really fast. Okay, next. All right, so next basic command we got here is nix run. All right. Uh, nix run is to basically, like, I just want to quickly run something. I know what its name is. I don't really want to install it or keep it around for a long time. Um, and I, great, I just want to run something. It's, you say, hey, I want to nix run. You say where you're going to get it from. You can get it from nix packages or any other package set that's out there. Um, and you say, hey, hash. This one, my example is BTOP. I want to run this piece of you know, software, and it just runs it. It does a few things, like it downloads it, it makes sure that you have it locally, all its dependencies exist, and then you just run that piece of software, but you're not actually installing it anywhere, anywhere permanently, so it could actually, you know, a few days later, just be completely gone and off your system because there's some garbage collection mechanism behind the scenes. But this is for just quickly running something because you need quick access to it, but you're not gonna, you don't want to keep it around. Question? Yeah, so the question is, is it common to alias these things if you just want to quickly use them? Absolutely. There's a lot of people that just alias either like Nix packages or just most of this command, so they just want to run, I don't know, run BTOP or something. Yes, uh, people do that quite often. Question? Ah, good point. Someone turned on a VPN and bypassed all those rate limiting. So if you got a VPN, start turning them on. Thank you for the tip. Question. Yeah, if you got access to some server somewhere or some other machine, SSH to that and go from there. That will also help with the community uh, abuse of the public resources. <laughs> Next, keep your keep going. Okay, so with Nix run, um, if you need a little bit more kind of, I got like things I want to do, you could say, you could add additional, uh, uh, command line arguments. If you want to have something that has a dash in it for some sort of options or flags, you got to put in this little dash dash. That tells you, I'm no longer talking to Nix, I want to talk to whatever that program is. That's just a common mistake that uh, we people run into. All right. So, yeah, keep it going. So, questions so far? Issues? Has, have people been successful or able to do this at this point? Question. Yes. Yes, yeah, so the question is, um, you ran into a problem with um, Nix search uh, using too much memory on a two gigabyte system. Yep, that, for that initial search, it's gonna take four. Um, if you don't, uh, you can kind of bypass that in various ways and kind of still make it work, but yeah, uh, 
this is a problem we're still working on trying to fix. Nix packages is big, sorry. <laughs> Um, and it's going to take uh, something along at least like a four gigabyte uh, system to do that initial evaluation. Next yep, go on. Question, question left. This is probably a silly question, um, but are we getting an issue about uh, locales? Are those ECFA locales? Yeah, so if you run into an issue that references locales of some kind, uh, then please raise your hand and we'll have one of the volunteers uh, come help you out. So if, you, if, if you're an issue with either yeah, who's, who's a volunteer? Who can volunteer for fixing locale issues? I see a hand over there, so get together. If you run to anything that mentions a locale, then raise your hand, get some help. If you ha have anything that references a SSL uh, error or a SSL certificate error, also raise your hand and get help from someone with a lanyard or just someone who knows what they're doing. Go ahead. Okay, so a recommended uh, fix for this is to install NSCD. Thank you. Yeah, so, the, so the, the recommendation here is to apt install NSCD, but get together, just literally get up, let's stand up, let's kind of make this dynamic. Um, all right, we, question. Yeah, so the question is, um, what version of software is there in Nix packages? Uh, is it the latest and greatest? The answer is yes. That's why we love Nix packages. Um, so there's, <laughs> sorry? I'm sorry? Ah, if you don't like the latest and greatest, uh, you can actually run something that's older. So you can go to an older version of Nix packages, or if you want something even newer, you could start to build your own custom package that has something even newer. That's kind of a bit more advanced, but that flexibility is available to you. Uh, but generally speaking, Nix packages is pretty dang current. It's, it's actually one of the amazing things about it that it, uh, you know, in contrast to a lot of package managers out there, it's quite current, especially if you're running off of like the, the, the latest available. Yeah, if you want something that is kind of a bit more stable, moves a little bit slower, there's, we have uh, bi-yearly releases. Um, so the latest would have been uh, 2311. And then pretty soon we'll have 2405. Um, that's usually associated with a uh, Nix OS release. There's also a time period where there's a lot of work put in play to make things up to date, make things work really nicely together. Um, so there's like an island of stability basically every six months. Question. So the question is, can we compare and contrast uh, Nix run versus Nix shell? Yep, that's the next thing we'll cover is Nix shell. So Nix dash shell is, was, is basically the current stable way to do things. Nix space shell, Nix space run is kind of this future looking way to use the command line. Yes, so that's that experimental feature we turned on. So this is a clarification to the question about versions. There are a few resources available to, if you have a very specific version of some software you're looking for, um, there's a uh, website you can get to that says, you can put in an exact version for something and it'll tell you, here's the commit of Nix packages associated with that, or here's how you can get that exact version. Um, so that's a bit more advanced, kind of a bit more knowledge required to kind of make that work. Um, there are some tools out there as well that kind of give you easier access to that feature of saying, I want an arbitrary version of software, uh, but it's not necessarily built into like the core basic uh, feature set. Okay, um, question? Oh, okay, so common mistake, sorry. Um, so uh, Nix run is kind of this like quick access to something. 
Um, but a mistake is sometimes that the name of, the, so what, what's gonna run when you say, hey, I wanna run BTOP? Basically what happens, it goes, hey, well, here's a package named BTOP. It likely has a command called BTOP or it's configured with a particular thing to say what the main program is and it'll run that program. Now there are some packages that provide not just one binary, but let's say 10 or 50 or who knows what. Nixron has no way of knowing which one of those you want to run if one isn't configured or if you want to run one of the ones that's not the default. So that's like a common mistake with uh, um, packages that provide multiple binaries and that's actually we're going to cover how to kind of work around that next. Okay, next. So that, this, now we're back to Nick's shell. Um, and here, so what does Nick's shell do? Nick's shell be, uh, is kind of actually at, the, at its core, hopefully a very simple thing. It just says, we're gonna spawn a subshell with this thing now in, added to your path. That's it, right? And now you can now say, like, add something to your shell. I'm gonna Nick shell this, Nick shell that, and a few other things. And now you kind of have a shell where you have access to those programs. Again, the simplest possible kind of way of doing so is this thing gets added to your path. And it should use, continue to use your existing shell, so all your kind of aliases and kind of the things you've customized and enjoy doing on your command line should still be available to you. Um, yeah, go ahead, next one. So here's an example of a package that has all those multiple binaries. You have a bunch of binaries available, right, under this package called core utils, and you wanna run a particular one underneath it. Here's kind of a, a, an easy way to kind of bypass that limitation of Nick's run and say, hey, I'm gonna run this command date out of the core utils package. So that's, this is kind of like a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, involved because you have kind of know this distinction, but it gives you access to all those other uh, binaries available from the package. Oh, yeah, uh, apologies. Looks like dash dash got condensed into one glyph. So uh, it should be dash dash command. Thank you. Um, so the question is, how do you discover core utils? Um, so this is another one where we, we don't have a built-in mecha mechanism for this in Nix itself to tell you here is how to get a particular binary by name. There are some, there's other, other toolings, just for reference, it's called Nix index and Nix locate. Those things can help you search by, I'm looking for a particular library, I'm searching for a particular binary, and that will search the contents of the packages to give you uh, what the name is for some of these ones where the name doesn't quite match the package's name. Yeah. Uh, John again. Yeah, so uh, if you're on Nix OS, we usually install for you a helper that if you get, type just the uh, binary you wanna run or the, the command you wanna run, it will also help give you some hints, oh, you might mean this name or that name, but that's if you're on Nix OS. There's other ways to access that tool. If you want information about how to do that search, uh, raise your hand and try to get some help with that. Yeah, search.nixos.org. Um, actually, Rock over here is the one who built that. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, that will help you also search uh, for binaries if you're trying to find them. Okay, uh, next. Keep going. Yeah, so all this does is it just adds it to your path. Keep going. Let's. Yeah, so okay, here's this, an example of adding two different packages kind of in one command. You can kind of keep going and add 15 of them or 10 of them um, all at once if you wish to kind of say, hey, I wanna add all of these things to my path for whatever reason. Um, if you want to then be done with this, you just type exit, exit out of that subshell, go back into whatever your main shell is, and now that gets you know removed from your shell and you're back up and running to wherever you're doing before. Sorry. Is this the same uh, syntax as the Nix shebang? Yes. 
Um, if you're interested in, in the shebang, we're not going to cover that right now, but I will help you if you want because I love that feature. But that's a bit more advanced. Yeah. Um, so once you exit this, it's actually kind of gone. So again, kind of like Nick's run, that whatever that thing is that you installed might be gone in some amount of time if you've run some sort of garbage collection. So this is not a permanent install onto your machine. It's I want to quickly add it because I want this tool, but I don't really care about it long term. So this is another kind of ad hoc mechanism. So. So the question is, if I have two apps that need to work with each other, um, should I just use a profile instead? It really depends on what you mean by work together. If you mean it's like, if it's just two things that, um, two programs that you want in your path and you're just gonna pipe things from one to the other or just use them simultaneously, this will work, profiles will work, right? They're just in your path. They're just programs that are gonna run. Where you're gonna run into potential problems is if you want, if, if what you mean by work together means I have a compiler and a library then this approach will not work. So I would not recommend, unless you know what you're tr really trying to do, uh, don't try to install like development libraries in this mechanism or use them in this mechanism because this doesn't activate them in the way that uh, you want for that to work. This is kind of, again, another ad hoc to like just quickly get access to a program, quickly get access to something in your path. So uh, for, again, for libraries, that's why I mean by this is only adding something to your path. Um, the binaries, your path will have, allow you access to run them, but for, for libraries to see each other, there's other like, environment variables and there's other setup that's necessary for libraries to work. So the distinction is just gonna be like, yes, these things can run at the same time on this machine, you can kind of spawn programs, but it's specifically for development and like compiling and libraries where uh, this is not gonna be the recommended way. But we'll cover that in a second. Yeah, um, so questions up to this point? Sir. Oh, okay. The question is, is this the new way to do Nix-shell? Uh, Nix-shell does something very similar, but it does two or three other things as well. And over time, that kind of led to issues with confusion. So Nix-space-shell is kind of this one simple concept pulled out from that kind of legacy uh, command. And the way to think about it is Nix space shell, it just adds it to your path. That's it. And all of that other more advanced things that the other command used to do is now put into another uh, place. So this is kind of like a more limited feature to kind of keep things separated. Thank you for the question. Next. Yes, so the question is, how does this work if you call this multiple times? Yes, each time you call this as a new command, it will keep nesting you farther and farther into subshells. If you, if you want to avoid that, you can kind of say, Nick shell A, B, C, and D, and then kind of, you, know, you only have one subshell and only one to kind of exit out of. But yes, thank you for the question. Good question. Uh, once you've been so, uh, nesting down, sometimes it is hard to keep track of, well, how many times did I do this, or how far am I, and where am I? Uh, with, we don't have a command that tells you how many levels deep you are. Um, there's no kind of easy way to say, exit out of all of them to the top. Um, one thing that I often do is I just go, I, 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 I echo path. If my echo path looks ugly, because there's a bunch of stuff in there, I know I gotta keep going. Uh, there's, you could do things with shell levels. There's other kind of ways that like potentially we can solve this problem, but that is a user interface issue at the moment. Shell integrations can help here. That can do some of this logic for you. I think there's something in ZSH that kind of help you with this. I think people have bashed ways to like make this easier, but built in and like here's like the recommended way. Well, there isn't a huge one yet. So we're trying to make this user interface better. That would be one thing to make it uh, easier to use. Ah, ZSH integration uh, is. Yeah, so there's a few uh, integrations and a few kind of uh, uh, plugins you could use that make that easier. Um, who entered today, not without the Nix on their oh, um, computer, and is already having Nix shell 
an environment, like Nick shell with the packages inside. Run around. <laughs> Who came without knowing anything about Nix and is now at least somewhere along the path of this thing? We're handing out pogs and things. <laughs> if you want a pog, raise your hand, basically. <laughs> okay. Uh, try to keep going a little bit. We go a little bit farther. Okay. So next command. This is going to. Oh, sorry. Before that, we have. Oh, we're, we're good with questions. So next, next build. This is where it's going to start getting a little bit more involved. But I just want to introduce this so that you're aware of like what what's going to be happening. So if you call nix build on the reference to some sort of a package. Uh, you run this thing, what ends up happening? You get this results sim link. But let's break it down a little bit. There's a few things that are going to happen, and some of these might have already happened if you've already run, uh, did a, something like a Nix run or a Nix shell. But what, ends up, what it does is it goes, hey, uh, let me go find this reference. Let me go see what it refers to. And it checks to see if you have it locally. If you have it locally, awesome. If you don't, it's going to try to download it from binary cache. If you can't download it for, from the binary cache for, for whatever reason, maybe because there's too many people using the internet, then it actually might try to fall back to, well, let's say it's possible that no one's ever built this ever in the history of the world, and I'm going to try to build this from scratch. And this is kind of, this fallback mechanism is uh, sometimes confusing. It can be kind of a little bit weird. So if you see this something building that you're like, this shouldn't be building, it might just be because you don't have access to the internet or for, for other reasons. Um, but this is what Nix build does. And then lastly, it says once it's all done, once it's either compiled your software or it downloaded it from a binary cache to make it faster, it gives you a sim link at dot slash result. And that sim link will be uh, a pointer to the location of where that package got put onto your system. And then you have now easy access to it. Once you start having custom packages, clearly, you know, no one's ever built it before because you got your own custom code. This is a common way to just I want to build something, I have access to it, I can run it, I can inspect it, I can do things with it. Um, and this is how you hook into the like, build manager, the, the build process uh, piece of the Nix ecosystem. Uh, issues, problems with this, how are people doing? Are we going too slow, too fast? Thoughts? Just yell them out. Oh, well, okay, uh, any questions? So far, we're going to kind of now go a little bit less out of the commands and come kind of more into like uh, explanations of a few things. If you have any questions or need help, raise your hand. Yep. Sorry? So the question is, um, when you run the build command and you get the binary, where does it come from? Uh, very good question. Uh, we're going to cover that in the concepts, but basically uh, we, there's a cache that's run by the like, NixOS community, uh, the Nix community, and it's kind of been built for you, and then it gets downloaded and, and uh, placed there. So it uh, is a helpful binary cache to make things faster for you. But we'll go over some of those concepts in a, in a second. Thank you, Tom. That was long, huh? Um, he must be thirsty. There we go. OK, flakes. If you, those of you who know Nix, the logo, um, or you have the um, pog, it looks like a snowflake. Flakes is a code name for um, We'll explain why, but it's a code name for this experimental feature, which um, one of the uh, goals of it was to uh, simplify, make a UX a bit nicer on many areas. That's why we're also using it. The first question, uh, actually a lot of newcomers to Nix ask, should I use Flakes? It makes complete sense. Uh, to ask this question, because uh, it's experimental, but everybody's telling you to use it. It's confusing. We are uh, hopefully going to stabilize it soon enough so uh, that we can uh, mark it as non-experimental. Um, as I told you, Nix is a community. We have different opinions. 
While we agree on 90% of the features or 95% of the features of Flakes, there are still some disagreements how to for the last 5%. You know, the last 5% is the hardest, as we all know. So it's going to take some time before this gets stabilized. But uh, if you're new to Nix, please use them. I think you'll have a much better experience uh, using them. If you don't want to use them, also fine. That's, there is nothing. Just the, some instructions might be different. Uh, but you can still do all the things that we do with the flakes. You can do them with all commands. Just it's a bit more involved, a bit few more steps. So. Flakes, as I said, are currently experimental, but they are being uh, developed for so long that they are considered like a stable piece of, um, of Nix. Uh, by stable, I mean um, they work well. It's no, they are, we are not experimenting in a way that there might be bugs inside. They're quite useful. And I think everybody that uses Nix, uh, majority of them, uh, are using it. Uh, at least this, is, this was told by uh, the survey that we ran each year. Uh, yes, so there is a, it's already, <laughs> you open a, how it's called, Pandora's box. Uh, yes, there are many people that want to do this, uh, and there are many sides of the argument how to do it, but there are discussions. Um, I think we need to drink more when we discuss this, uh, like alcohol, because then, you know, the, uh, we will reach the point, uh, the point of agreement uh, uh, much faster. But yes, um, I was hoping it's going to be done by today. Uh, actually, by last year, it's not. It's uh, yeah, it's going to happen uh, at one point or the other. There might be a few changes, you know, how it's get implemented, but um, I, I don't expect much bigger. No, oh. member so, of Nix. So uh, that is the like the roadmap for the Nix team to make it non-experimental, and the path towards that is to basically break it down into smaller components and stabilize things step by step until we essentially have all of it. So the beginnings of that's going to be fetch tree and then some of these other like aspects. Um, but yes, that it is the intention, but it is a large step, a contentious step, and trying to navigate that is well not easy. But we're, we, yes, we're trying. Okay, next. Um, so just to remind you, what makes Flakes uh, turn on uh, is to edit the Nixcon file. Uh, you need to able two experimental features, which kind of work side by side, Nix command, Nix, Nix uh, dash command, and flakes. Um, okay, next. So the question, what I just said, experimental, but we still don't know what flakes are. As a user, um, I would say you will be notice flakes as two things. Next. There are two files on your project that you will start, which is Flakes Nix and Flakes Lock. As any package manager that you're used to, uh, you have, let's, let's take a NPM an exam, as an example. You will write a package.json, correlates to flake.nix, where you describe your project, and automatically the NPM um, command line will generate um, the lock file for you. Same works in Nix. You don't have to write your lock file. It's being generated for you at the, time, at the first usage and then being reused. Um, so here, uh, I really hope you see this, but this is the first time you see some Nix code. I don't want to scare you. We will actually go line by line. So by the time, by the end of this workshop, you will actually understand what this does. And it's actually not going to be that scary. But I want to explain three concepts in Flakes, what this file tries to do, what, what you try to accomplish with flake.nix. First one, you define inputs. In this case, we defined Nix packaging input, and we pointed, as you might see, to some GitHub location. So that's our input. So that's the, all the collection of uh, packages. The second thing that we, uh, um, the second um, the thing to explain with Flakes is, the second concept is outputs. You, uh, so what this Flake uh, produces. So in simple, ten, uh, in simple form, we take the inputs, we do something with them, and we provide you uh, some outputs. This is like a function, right? And that's actually also what it is. 
And the third concept, which is a bit, maybe a bit, um, you, you, you need to get used to it, uh, as you will use flakes a lot, and also the command line, is this syntax, uh, starting with this URL, GitHub, colon, and so, this is called flake references, and they're being used all over, also from the command line. Uh, this one, I chose it, this style, because it's sort of, uh, I, I hope without explaining it, it makes sense what it does. It basically says, go to GitHub, to Nix.js organization, take Nix packages, repository, and go to the branch called Nix.js unstable. So there are many other ways to point to a resource online. Either it's just a URL, or it's Mercurial, or it's GitHub, or just Git. Uh, so I will not go into all of them, but I think most useful is this one um, for now. In this example, also what we do, um, what we define as an output here, I'm gonna go on this side. So we defined a set of packages. That's the first packages dot, if you see it here. After that comes a system. So you provide an output for a specific system. As I was writing this on my Mac, um, that's my uh, system for the Mac. And then we provide htop, or basically I should actually write any name. So we, this will be our output. We assign to this output something from Nix packages. Again, Nix packages is a flake which also provides outputs. Those outputs are a bit different. In this case, we uh, point to legacy packages and the system and the package in that system. So we will go through each line so you understand the language, so please don't be scared. Uh, I promise in 10 minutes the Linux language will be clear because it's not that hard. Um, now to use the output from that, um, from this flake, uh, we have a syntax uh, that starts with a dot. So when uh, a new command that you learned before was nix build, but you pointed to nix packages and build htop or gtop from nix packages. In this case, I'm saying nix build dot, pointing to the current directory you're at, hash, and htop. And this htop is the same as this one. It's good to be tall. Um, so now you know how you can, ex uh, how you can pro uh, define outputs uh, with um, how you define inputs and outputs in a flake, why this is important. Uh, we will see maybe in six slides later, but this is the, the, the reason why we do this. It, we used to do this in a different, in files that were named randomly, not, there was no one file, so we had to search. This was before flakes. We had different mechanisms to lock these files and keep those locks updated. We have different standards, how, how, what things were exposed. So we say, like, hey, let's just call these outputs. Um, we have different uh, ways to provide inputs. So flakes, it's just a standard that does a few things. Most notably, it um, provides a nice UX for you on the command line. If you want to work with a flake, don't forget, dot in the beginning, current repository. Okay, questions? Sorry? Uh, to, for this to work? No. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Oh, the, just so you know, GitHub, um, okay, they unrate limited us on GitHub. Thank you, GitHub. Uh, Two questions here. Uh, can you speak up? Just yes. Um, this is a language question. So I will defer it. It will make sense once we hit a few slides later. Yes? How do you discover the left-hand sites from that that are available? How do you know to write the word packages and not 
Yes. So um, the question was, how do I know that I have to export packages and not just something else? Um, there is, uh, this is basically the, the um, decided standard. So packages is the key name. We will also see others. Um, there are dev shells, there are templates we have also. Um, yeah, there is a schema for this. And um, yeah, there are also extensions to this schema. Uh, Nix will still work even if you provide your own. So let's say you mistyped or you type something else, it will not, not allow you to work with that flake. Uh, it will throw warnings at you, that's all. So you can extend it, but yeah. Documentation covers this in detail, like how, what's the resolution? Thank you. I forgot to mention this, but yes. Question was, um, the Nix build command, does it imply packages? Yes, Nix build command implies packages. I could actually write the full um, name after the hash, saying packages dot my arch and the h top what I export. Nix build defaults to ser to search inside packages for the current arch. Uh, if so, you could also build something cross platform. So you would build, um, let's say, uh, some other system which is supported. So not everything can be built cross platform, but you could do this as well. Um, so this. There are other commands that default to something else, and we'll see a few slides later. Uh, one question, yes? One more. Yes. Um, so there are other commands which we didn't cover, how to discover what's inside flakes. Um, the commands to, to um, uh, to look into what's, what uh, other flakes output are nix flake show and nix flake, flake info is also another. They show very similar, or metadata, sorry. Nix flake show and nix flake metadata. Those two commands will show what, one will show what the inputs are and the other one will show what the outputs are. Yes, please. Yes, this is, I was waiting with this for, to finish the questions because this is, so the question is, what are legacy packages? Hard one to explain, but here is my best. Nix packages um, were uh, started before we, uh, we, um, before we started working on flakes. We notice few limitations in Nix packages. So you will notice in Nix packages, we have a tree structure of, of our packages, which is not the most um, efficient in terms of how we handle. When we started working with flakes, we noticed this and we set ourselves to fix it. So an old, let's say, it's still current way, to be honest, it's still the only way, but we, in Flakes, we're calling it already legacy packages. So in legacy package, packages, you have access to the tree of packages, meaning instead of htop on the, on the end, you can say python packages dot and uh, tra um, traverse uh, deeper. While with packages, that traverse, uh, traversal is not possible, right? That's one of them. Um, so eventually, Eventually, in the future, once Flakes get stabilized uh, and a few changes happen in Nix packages, we will also see um, um, and few uh, design decisions need to be made, but we will switch to packages. For now, the only uh, Flake that I know of that uses legacy packages is actually Nix packages. There are a few others, but they are sort of doing it just to, um, to be able to uh, work with uh, with the old Nix system, oh, with old Nix commands. But that's the only reason, sort of, it's like compatibility reasons. Uh, the only really, that only exports legacy packages is Nix packages. This is a bit confusing, but, so, I think the, thumb of, the rule of thumb is um, only use legacy packages with Nix packages, you will hit, um, you will avoid most of the, uh, the uh, bugs this way. Yes? Uh, 
Um, that is to be decided. I don't think it will. I think there is a lot of, uh, maybe it will, maybe por portions of it will. That depends. That's, that's to yet to be discovered, and I, I would not weigh on any of this, like one is better than the other. I don't want to go into the mono-repo, multi-repo discussion, at least not while I'm so sober. Um, <coughs> but, yeah. Um, so the question was, what would be the notation for uh, in the future? I don't know. That's exactly why we, we, we don't have, like, we didn't decide upon anything. But there's going to be something. Um, there are many directions of this. Let's discuss them after, because, you know, they're, they're a nice challenge to solve, right? Yes, behind? Yeah, 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 there are ways. Um, I, I would put this in t towards you. Um, we are talking now, uh, I, we, I don't want to confuse a lot of, I want to avoid confusion for a lot of newcomers. I know that there are many ways how we can go around this, um, but from the perspective of somebody who arrived to this room without Nix on their laptop, and they already, having, they already know how to run Nix search, Nix shell, and they just solved the uh, Nix, uh, Nix run, Nix install, and so on, and they already just saw Nix language for the first time. Um, the, the rule, the uh, uh, rule to, to give them the rule that use legacy packages only with Nix packages will avoid some um, problems uh, along the road. Because remember, we're just trying to get you across the cliff so that you get all the benefits. That will, that's one of the suggestions. I saw some hand here? No? No. Okay. Question when you saw this, uh, or ideas that you saw when you saw this syntax was, I have to learn yet another configuration language. Raise the hand if when you saw this, this happened. Oh, me too. Um, when I first saw it, really cannot we just use any other number of them? Um, there are reasons why. Uh, first, 2003, those were not around. Uh, and there are some really nice features of Nix language they, once you reach some advanced levels. That is why that cliff uh, of learning, learning curve of Nix is, has that cliff in it. Sadly, um, that's how it is, but 10 minutes, uh, and I'll teach you enough of Nix that you can uh, be dangerous, that you can break some more stuff. Uh, just to give you confidence to go next. I don't want you to fall off the cliff. I just enough so that you will enjoy the pain. Question in the back. Thank you. Um, Yes, the last configuration language to learn. Um, it actually ends up, like, it really feels like this at the end. Uh, so it, there is some truth in that, um, but clearly, you know, uh, play with other languages, they're, they're also cool. So let's go next. Let's explore, let's learn to understand what we just saw. And we'll go through some basic things. This looks a lot of, like um, JSON, with a bit different, right? Same thing. So um, next, name and value. We call this concept uh, attribute set, uh, and inside you have keys, and you assign values to keys, right? Nothing new. Like objects in JSON, dictionaries in Python, Hashmax, Ruby, you name it. Uh, some other language has some other names, but we call them Important, when you will read uh, documentation, attribute set. So, set that has attributes. Question, please. Uh, again, the, what is the name? You... Attribute set. Attribute set is always, it's meant something that, that you're used to from Python, the dictionary, some, a collection of key value uh, I, uh, items, so that you can. 
Yeah, uh, sometimes you, yeah, of course, sometimes you only use set because we are lazy and because we are programmers, right? Okay, next. <coughs> so, there are a few dif differences in the syntax between JSON and Nix, uh, meaning, well, you don't have to quote, uh, quote every string, so the keys don't have to be quoted, but you can quote them. You can have multi-line strings, yay. Right, so it's like just for this reason use Nix, not no JSON uh, joke, but it gets really useful. Um, we have integers, we have floats, we have booleans, and of course we have also null. Um, that actually is invalid. I should quote the null here to make it work. But uh, question? Can you have dynamic or interpreted keys? Uh, yes, I'll show you two slides forward. Um, we also have comments, so if you want JSON with comments, use Nix. Question? Uh, for multi-line strings, does it include the white space prior to each line? Like uh -huh. So multi-line strings, <coughs> um, how do we handle the, the prefix of spaces, right? Um, in Nix, it, um, it takes the first, uh, so it strips the spaces before and after, and it takes the, it aligns everything by the, the first line. So works has, I don't know, four spaces there. So it will be, it will remove all the four spaces from every pre, uh, following line. So you can have nice indentation, not something from the beginning, so you can, it will collapse nicely in your editors. Uh, you know, yeah, exactly. YAML cannot do this, use Nix. Um, let's continue, we also have lists. We can have different types of um, uh, types in the list. Um, and one uh, extra thing in Nix that it's not, uh, that maybe is not in other configuration languages, but it makes very good sense in a package manager is that we, how we handle the paths. And so you can reference paths in three different ways. You can have them uh, relative paths. You can have absolute paths to point to some file. Most, most likely you're gonna point to a other Nix file to import. And then, uh, yeah, you can also the hyphen, um, uh, point to your home. Question? Yes, um, exactly. That's that's one of the differences which I have hard time switching from one to another language, from Nix to other languages. Is we have spaces. You will notice there are no co uh, how do you say English commas. Yeah, sorry. Um, are you scratching your head, or was the question? Oh, okay, scratching. Um, so these are the like the basic. Um, types that we have that you operate, they are a bit, um, sort of, they expand on the, on if you compare it to JSON or YAML, but you will see where it gets really useful. Next one. Uh, before I continue, is, this was, that's all clear, right? Similar to JSON, but not the same. Of course, uh, please, Pog. Good, thank you for noticing this, because I thought nobody will, uh, so I will, I will try to, I will answer later, but the top level um, object uh, uh, in every file does not end with a semicolon, but every other line, as we see, ends. That's the rule. So thank you for noticing. Yeah, 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 that's... Uh, you, you must be one hell of a programmer, I'll say this. You notice this. Um, so yeah, the top level object, at the end, you don't put uh, a semicolon. Every other line, you have to. Please, uh, question? Um, let's explore this a bit later, when we will work with Nix Eval and um, Nix Rappel. Next one. 
Yes. So um, the next thing I want to sort of, you will see it a lot of times. We didn't see it in the flakes example, but we're going to rewrite it uh, to make it a bit nicer. And actually, uh, to answer a question from, um, from, uh, from before, which was about how you can construct for multiple, operate, uh, multiple architectures and stuff. So we have this called rec keyword at the, completely at the beginning before. This turns the attribute set into a recursive attribute set, meaning you can reference other keys in uh, an attribute set. Okay, that's an important one, uh, meaning description, you can ref reference it to the key also description. This is sometimes confusing, but rec recursive attribute set. Okay, we're doing good. Thumbs up if this was all clear so far. Lots of thumbs up. I'm doing something good. What I like to use Nix for is to have a really quick templating language. In Nix, to include in a string some other uh, um, value, you can use it as a template. You see, a template will become um, what the output of the template key is going to be my first flake rocks. Um, and this also works in a multi-line, right? You, it will insert the description there. Um, will you use this to replace any static side generators? Most likely not, but people did, and there's other tools like static side generators with Nix, because why not? Um, but this is really useful when you, when you are writing uh, best scripts that need to interact with certain part of the system in the Nix system. We'll see it later where this really comes useful, but um, just having a, an, uh, an ability that you can template in this configuration language, language is a really powerful feature. Question? Oh. Um, substitution? Yeah, you mean the templating. OK, uh, this is not only uh, for uh, a recursive attribute set, although this is the case because I wanted to fit two features in one slide. So you could use this in any other attribute set, but in recursive attribute set, I could just reference the description, but it could be anything else. We will see also other ways how to not do recursive attribute set, uh, like a local variables. I think that comes next. Um, but yes. Uh, so. You don't have to use recursive in order to use the template. OK, I see some nodding. Let's move. Yes, so speaking of the local variables, so to put something in the scope of the expression, you use the let in operator. In between, you have some expressions that, that you can then reuse in your, um, in your template. Can you move one more? So in this case, uh -huh, we use in the description. Oh, it's a bit, um, we go a bit deeper. Uh, another, uh, you can also have conditionals, so the if else statement. Um, I think there's uh -huh, questions. Of, oh, OK. Um, so in this case, what we're showing is first a string. We are reading something that is defined in the local variable, so it's in the scope, so it's visible at, this, at that point. And we are just returning first or not first. And then we're reusing this one um, as first string, first a string. Does somebody notice an error here? Um, yes, answer? Um, the order, no, but good, good guess. Uh, that was it. The order does not matter. It's sort of one expression gets. Um, it does not matter if you release NixOS already. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the the attribute set is not recursive, so first a string would not be. This actually what you see now will not work. But if I would put rec before the attribute set, it will start, it will work. Somebody, 
do, uh, I don't want to ask in a negative way, how do I ask this? If I, say, if I ask somebody does not understand it, I will single you out. But how do I know that somebody, I need to repeat it? Do I need to repeat this? But that was threatening, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no way to win. Uh, question there? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, w which portion of it? Where did you, uh... <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you for volunteering. Uh, w question? Was... Uh huh. If you have multiple items inside let in, uh, they are recursive, so they, they see each other. They are in the same scope. Uh, no, 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 inside let in. So if I would have multiple, where I have is underscore first equals true, if I would have more lines there, because you can have, we will see also later, you will need, uh, we will actually see an example of that. Uh, question in the back, and then you. There was somebody on the left side, no? Uh, there. I will stop you. You said he was demonstrated using a function. We haven't even reached functions yet. Uh, we will. Yes, just for the sake, it's a, um, calling yourself stupid is not good, but it's a stupid example that I came up, uh, but it's, yes, yes, yeah. A context block, local variable, yeah. Question here and then there. Yes. Um, I, in the last slide, I had rec, I think. Um, because there is no rec. I did this intentionally, a broken example. Um, it's in the notes. Uh, but uh, in order to provoke why this will not work, right? So that we go and discover. Yes, because? Yes, yes, yes. You can still use uh, the templating syntax without the recursive set. That is not in the context. Uh, yes? And then. Um, it's, it depends on the use case. I think it's a lot of times comes down to your style. Um, sometimes recursive set can be confusing, and sometimes let ex, let in expression is a bit more verbose. Now, if you don't want that verbosity, you you go to the recursive set attribute set. Uh, question to the left. Yes, iteration will cover. Is it right? Oh, shit. Okay, I'll wrap it in two, three minutes. Um, yes? Um, what's the error if this is not, what, this will return an error that the first a string is not uh, defined. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It will still work, even if you don't use recursive set. Because um, they are things that you can shoot yourself easily. Like, you know, as I said, style, different people, different opinions. Um, I'll, we'll have to run. We are r running out of time, but I really like, would like you to learn Nix. Next thing to, this, uh, to learn is functions. I define here a simple function, two arguments, see the semicolons, argument one, semicolon, argument two, semicolon, and then the expression uh, 
in this case, we just uh, sum the two arguments. Um, and then I do this in a Latin expression so that I can use it uh, outside, right? And I basically sum one and two. I have one more slide and then we're 15 minutes, okay. Um, so this makes sense because we'll expand a bit on it. Next one. Yeah, uh, did I say semicolon? Oh, apologies. Uh, semicolon goes to the end. Colons goes in the where you define the at function arguments. At the back. So, the, so arg one is argument one of a function called sum. Okay, and then you have first argument, second argument, and the expression that gets returned. I see thumbs up. Damn, I'm good. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's go next. So, well, one thing that we also just come, like the functions is any other functional programming language, you can do partial application. Right? So you can do sum one, and this becomes like add one function, and I then use it add one plus two. Uh, the example is the same, returns the same value. Um, it's partial application, I think this is the, just like a cool thing to have. Sometimes confusing, but still cool. Next. Um, in, in many languages, programming languages, uh, you have named arguments a lot of times. In this case, I changed the function to a named argument. So this is a bit of reusing the attribute set style because we provided one arg argument because you see only one column. But that argument, we expanded it in the, in the form of attribute set, which means when I, call, uh, when I call at the bottom sum, I have to provide all the arguments. In this case, there is also a syntax to provide a default value. That question mark is a, it will, if you don't provide it, as I did in this case, the default value of arc two is going to be number two. Yes? Question? Is it a recommended practice to use attribute set to hold uh, like multiple arguments for a single function rather than using like a curated function that you were earlier? Um, again, depends on the use case. You know, you, I think in any language you have uh, reasons to do either or both because. After that, I could, I could have another argument or another named argument set, right? So uh, depends on the style, depends what you're actually doing, how the API of that function call looks to you, so it all depends. Experience usually tells you that you did something wrong, so. Yes? Yeah, so there are ways, um, um, there are ways how to organize the code. Uh, I will leave actually up to you after this talk because there are ways that people, you can do, you can have it in another file. You can then import it, bring it to this file. There are ways how to organize it, you know, play with it. It's a language, break it, uh, curse at it, all those things. Um, yeah, so functions, right? Again, JSON. So Nix, what is Nix, how we like to describe it is just a, Nix is like a JSON with commands and functions, multi-line strings, a few more things. Next. Um, yes, so how do we run the Nix code, right? So now we learn a bit of the language, but instead of using packages like we did before, how would I experiment with Nix language? You know, you write some file, you write some Nix code in a file, how do I um, yeah, run it? There is a subcommand called eval, so you do nix eval and dash dash expression, and then you put an expression. So if you need to type, uh, quickly check something, one plus two, you get three out, yes. If you have a file, you provide dash dash file, an example, and the output is what was of that file, basically, if you return an attribute string, so on. 
Uh, there is another one. Uh, you say, I only want a description out of that file. That's the syntax. So you, at the end, you provide a description, and it will take that key out of the attribute. Or complain that you didn't return the attribute set, but you returned something else, that you returned an integer. Yeah, that's it. Um, OK. There is another way, a uh, more interactive way. As any nice language, you will have a Nix uh, REPL. We also have it, Nix REPL. In this case, you go into it. You will see there is no description, right? Because it's how. There is a dash L, which uh, the dash load or dash L. You load the example.nix code, and you type, and then the description becomes available because it loaded that attribute set. So this is way how you can sort of have the REPL experience, so you can type one plus two, and you will get three. You play what's there, and then you uh, you can also load the files from um, that you work on, right? So it's like best of both. What do you use? Up to you, your style, your choice, your computer, your time. Next. So yeah, to finish it off, this was I skipped so many things that it's almost embarrassing. Uh, but this is enough that you will understand flake.nix. Other resources. Manual. This is a reference manual. So treat it as what are, the, what is the, what are all the built-in functions which we didn't even cover. You will get them there. Next. So that's the, how it looks when you get there. Um, next one is there is a really nice tutorial that will guide you to learn the language in depth. Uh, that's the link. And it's, the, there are, I don't know, it's really long. It will take you at least a few hours to go through quickly. Uh, to really learn it, you can come back to it all the time. I did, even after five years of using Next. And uh, there is also a bit behind the scenes in how all these concepts and also other concepts built upon each other, they are called Next pills. And go back one, no. This one. This is the slide we started with, right? Looking back at this, is there an increase of knowledge of understanding what this does, right? So first of all, one slide got skipped, removed, but okay. Um, we, we defined some inputs. Outputs, now, we, now I can say it because you will understand it. Outputs are a function of inputs that return some at attribute set. Again, really slowly. Outputs is a function, you see the column, that had all the insight as arguments, all the inputs that we define above. Self is referencing to the self, to the current folder. So you, what's the revision and so on. Oh, so outputs is a function of inputs and you return an attribute set specific of a specific format, so pa for packages. And then you build it. See? It took longer than 10 minutes because I'm um, yeah, hard with words, but uh, question? Yeah. OK. Wrapping up. Yeah, that's. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, wrap that up. So hopefully, uh, basically, we had a lot of questions. Uh, hopefully, you answered some of them. And hopefully, you have more questions now than you started with. But hopefully, they're different questions. Um, so we're going to move on to the uh, next event at this point, And hopefully, all of this kind of gives you just kind of like a, a, a shock-style introduction to a bunch of things. Hopefully, uh, that means as we go on to additional ideas and concepts, you kind of have heard them before. And, just be a repetition throughout the day, you'll kind of get more and more of these things. And as always, if you have any questions, ask someone. Very likely someone to your left or right might have done this before. Please like, start kind of getting interactive. If you need to have a, a particular in-depth thing, we can kind of go off to the side and, and work on these things in between the events. Um, but yeah, so far, uh, thank you so much. And I'll hand it off to Zach here.